fabulous friends, fans, and superstars, welcome to Synchronicity Web TV. I am your host, Nadia Shaw, and this is your moment of synchronicity. Well, I'm so excited to celebrate with you today, Catherine O'Connell. Now, I, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background here. Catherine and I just started talking immediately. I just met her today, and I started spilling my guts, and we started having so much fun and laughing. And I was like, look, Catherine, we got to turn the camera on. Because I do want to let you guys know as well that Catherine is coming to Synchronicity University as part of the March 2024 speaker series. And you've got just a little time left to choose your tuition rate as low as just $5 a class, an unheard of rate to learn from people as brilliant as Catherine, as you are about to see. She is uh, spiritual. She is sensitive. She's passionate about astrology. She's authored several books. She's a clinical psychologist. She's worked with the president uh, and she's an interfaith minister. And I, I think you are about to see just why I instantly felt like this is an amazing person. And I'm so grateful to meet her and celebrate her with you today. So Catherine, welcome. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. What a joy and a delight. It is so much fun. And uh, as I was saying, we were talking already and about the different things, but I know you're going to be teaching about uh, the medicine in the dreams, right? Can you talk about that? Just talk about that. I have a feeling you're going to say something and then I'll jump in and then we'll have a wonderful conversation. So just oh. tell me about that. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, fantastic. And I'd love to loop back and answer a question that you you asked me several minutes ago, and then we kind of meander in other areas and had a great time, you know. And so I'm going to answer the question you asked me about astrology of dreams. Yeah. Right? Yes. And yes. I write a lot about astrology in uh, dreams, especially the planet Saturn, which is funny because we've been talking about Saturn, right? Yeah. Why Saturn? You know, and I... I've been doing this for many, many years. And I have to say that it's become apparent to me relatively recently why Saturn. Do you remember the old name for Saturn? Kronos. And what Kronos means in English? It has to do with time, right? Yes. That's like right. the cro the chronological and, and the watch. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it really has to do, I'm thinking, you know, I'm noticing that it really has to do with the time clocks coordinating our prodromal time clocks in our bodies with the universe time clocks. Wow. So it's a lot more profound than, mm -hmm. than many of us would have read in a book, particularly if we were reading books many years ago about astrology and Saturn, right? Mm -hmm. I've been an astrologer for 60 years, right? And it wouldn't have said anything like that, not, not anything that I saw, right? It was more like time clocks, like exactly what you said. So Saturn, uh, I've got a whole separate presentation called Becoming Saturn, just on uh -oh. Saturn. Fascinating you can Saturn. come back to Synchronicity University and teach that as well. Yeah. yeah and it kind of brings, you know how it is, you, you chase one rabbit down a hole and you get, and the hole becomes a whole cavern and you're, you know, you're going through the whole universe of holes. Yes. That is <laughs> what it is to be an astrologer, isn't it? Yeah. 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 It's never a dull moment. Astrology has to do with everything. And so, so it's just too much fun. It's legal, and it's just too much fun. It's know? legal fun, and it's way too much fun. And it gives you a high, and the, the high is like what makes you giddy in the way that we're giddy right now because we get to talk about astrology. But when you were talking about time, I also thought about, you know, imperfect time, right? Like I, I, I always like to say uh, – it, whenever the universe wants, all these things work out in perfect time, according to the universe and things like that. And it really helps not to get too wound up or attached to things that ultimately are ephemeral. Um, and yeah. it's interesting, you mentioned that having to do with Saturn, because Saturn really does teach us that value of, of time, not just like to make use of your time, but to trust time as well. My Saturn is in the first. What? That is a whole... Not, it's not in the 12th house, but it's very strong. And yes. It has a little 12th house. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. With, with Aquarius stuff in it. A lot of mm -hmm. Aquarius stuff in it. <laughs> right? I love it. So, so anyway, so Saturn is kind of is underrated in my opinion a lot. And uh, for instance, the uh, I came to notice that the, there's a strong relationship 
and I've been researching this for 40 years now, between Saturn cycles and our dreams and the cycles of uh, the universe. Now, if you know how set, you know the glyph of Saturn, we all see it, but do we really see it? You know, doesn't it kind of look like a little throne? It really does. Yes. If he's on a throne, who's his consort on his, you know, a, a king needs a queen or whatever. Who, who would be his consort? I wondered. Who would be the consort? Like if we had to choose a planet? If we had to choose, yeah, a planet. And or does an it, asteroid. Okay, okay. Or an or asteroid. Or, you know. Okay, okay. Maybe Athena? That's interesting. So let's play with this just for a second. Let's let's say you know how the the Greek you know the Romans borrowed from the Greeks and the bar and the Greeks borrowed from the Egyptians, Egyptians and the Egyptians from the Sumerians, from the Sumerians and yeah yeah. Blah, 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 right yes yes. So, so let's be liberal here and go back a little further. So I I'm thinking that it's Mat Maat M A apostrophe A T Mat in in the Egyptian pantheon right was the uh, very close to Isis, as some say, was a, was a power of Isis. Mm -hmm. That had a lot to do with the clocks of the heavens and the movements and the seasons. Mott actually keeps the stars in place so they don't fall and keeps the heavenly clocks going. Mm. So I'm thinking that Saturn has to do with clocks, but at a lot more sophisticated level than we maybe give credit, and maybe works together in that in that universal clock mm. realm that's, that's so um, fantastic that we're learning more and more about. You know, one of the, you know one of the specialties you can take now in medical school, like at Stanford, is chronobiology and chronotherapeutics. What's mm. the best time of day to take an aspirin? What's the best time of month for a woman who needs a surgery on her breast to undergo surgery? They don't call it astrology, but what does it sound like to you and me? Exactly. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So timing. And, and one of the most exciting areas of dream research is uh, what they call prodromal dreams. Another Greek word, prodroma, right? Prodromal mm. meaning our psyche and how it lines up with our biology and our biological clocks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're making big breakthroughs on this one. But when the, the beginning of those real breakthroughs in research came out of Russia and came out of uh, in the 60s and 70s, my Russian is pretty, uh, I had some Russian, but it's not great. You know what I mean? And it was before the internet. So there was a lot that I couldn't translate kind of frustrating at that time now a lot of things are translated you might know i'm i'm involved with the international association of the study of dreams iasd they're they're the major international dream organization both in terms of lab research and shamanism and everything in between that's why they're fascinating because you know it, it, it's it's science and it's also the storytelling in one organization so it's kind of fascinating and and I've been lucky to to ask they've asked me through over the past fifty years to present for them a number of times. So the last time I presented for them was in the early nineties when I was beginning to do this dream research and connect Saturn with with all of this. And the most recent time I presented for them was last summer in Ashland, Oregon. So I had those thirty years. The day that they asked me to present, they didn't know, but I looked at the chart. It was the exact Saturn return of that last presentation. 30 years. Isn't that interesting? Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. So Saturn, very, very important. The clocks. And let's take a look at Saturn for a minute. You know, we take a look at 29, 30-ish years. If that's okay, we've got the opening square, the opposition, mm -hmm. right? The closing square. So let's say that first opening square is when we're seven-ish. I've done a lot of uh, charts with regard to dreams and, and and people, including celebrities. Bruce Springsteen, I did quite a study of his. So what happened to him at seven? He had a tough early life. Anybody knows anything about him? Dad was a, you know, rageaholic, alcoholic. I mean, it's he acknowledges that in print. I'm not, you know, 
talking out of school here. It was a tough, tough childhood. His mom was in his corner, bought him his first guitar. And at six, seven, they switched him, sent him to Catholic school. He wasn't too crazy about it at first, but then he discovered they had a choir and he discovered singing. So he had a great time. He started to sing and he started to connect himself as a singer. Think of himself as a singer and a musician for the first time. Seven, anybody that's listening to this, think about yourself when you're about six or seven, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you came out of a family that was not so great, you might have had something that was a little ray of hope. Maybe there was a family friend that got you. You know, maybe you discovered reading. Maybe you discovered the woods in back of the house and you could be free playing in nature. Maybe you got a pet. Something that kind of gave you a little hope, right? And hope and joy are connected, you know, neurobiologically. Mm -hmm. A little hope that you could get through this disaster and that you had a core of something that was going to get through this and you were going to be, you had a glimmer into you, who you really are. That love. And that you were going to be resilient and get through whatever it was. That's the opening square. Let's take a look at the opposition. What happened mm -hmm. to Bruce at the opposition? We're 14 years old. Years. Yeah. Right. But some of us remember Ed Sullivan. <laughs> the Ed Sullivan show. He was the guy that brought the Beatles to the US. He mm -hmm. was the guy that brought Elvis Presley on TV. And when Elvis Presley was singing Hound Dog in 1964-ish, Bruce Springsteen was 14 and watching. And he said to himself, there's something about that that's me, essentially me. Mm -hmm. It was this, about the same time he was given a guitar and he started, he took his new guitar and he stood in front of the mirror and he watched himself playing guitar in front of the mirror. How much more oppositional can you get? Because an opposition really is that first opportunity to see ourselves in art in the mirror. Mm -hmm. He saw himself in his own mirror. And he said, oh, I am a musician. This is a core thing about who I am and what I'm here to do, my purpose. The closing square before his first Saturn return in his late 20s, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. He became famous very young. That was 21, yeah, yeah. Normally at 21 that happens. Right? He became mm -hmm. famous not only for his band, but also, you know, Bruce wrote a, wrote a lot of songs that became famous for other people. Mm -hmm. Really famous. You know, disco stuff and a lot of stuff that really, really, really hit the charts. A lot of people don't even know that. I didn't know that. And then, oh, interesting. So that's kind of what's going on young in his, in his early 20s. And yet, when he had his actual Saturn, actual Saturn return, 28, 28 and a half, he became depressed. Mm. Really depressed. Really depressed. He never became a drinker because he didn't want to be like his dad was. right? But he, he was prone to depression as his dad was. He did have some, probably some genetic predisposition. He felt so bad, he wasn't sure that he wanted to go on. And he felt like a fraud. So what did he do? He did something very interesting. He bought his first family home from when he was a child, which was on a river that he spent time on, which helped him get through his childhood. And there was this orange shag carpet. He, he went and settled in his old bedroom, the orange shag carpet. Mm -hmm. And somehow the carpet was very good for absorbing sound. It turned out to be a good place to record. He moved into that house for a while during the, during the dark night of the soul of his depression. And he recorded the album, Nebraska. Many people, including Bob Dylan, say that's his best album. It was the working man, that part of him, the blue collar guy, the working man, the acoustic guy, really kind of in the folk tradition, if you will, that felt the most like him. He's got Saturn and Virgo, like me. He needed that earthiness to get through, desperately needed that contact with the earth. He spent time on the river, you know, he spent time walking around in that land. It brought him out of his depression. He wanted to live again. Mm -hmm. So that's his first Saturn cycle. Isn't that interesting? Now, 
what does the word dream mean? Yeah, any idea? I didn't know this till a, a year ago. What does dream mean? I don't know, actually. I don't know the etymology of it or anything. What does it mean? A lot of things from a lot of language, but the most provocative one, Mm -hmm. from Middle English, it means music. Wow. Trippy, huh? Wow, that is trippy, yes. That's amazing. So at one point in the English language, yeah, yeah, it meant music. And it also means... Joy. Joy. <gasps> and joy is connected with hope. But when people ask me what my life purpose is, mm-hmm. I say everything is always about love for me, intention. But if you want a, a short sentence, my little elevator thing on my life purpose, I'm all about everything, personally and professional, it's about hope. Mm. I've always brought hope. And hope is about joy. And, of course, that's the star card of the Tarot for Aquarius. Okay. Mm. So hope and joy. And Bruce, so many times in his life, has described his life as a waking dream. Yes, he composes from things when he's asleep and is in a sleep and, and awake, and he considers it to be the same waking dream. Check this out. You know, I've done a lot of really interesting, I've had a lot of opportunities to study a lot of indigenous dream work from around the world. I'm an interfaith minister, as you know, so I've traveled a lot, right? And maybe the most interesting one was my closeness to the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, very close, deep, deep, many work. Many years I lived like a lama, but in the world. And so I did the Tibetan, the traditional dream work um, training, you know. I didn't do it for a whole year, that's for sure. Lamas traditionally, they go into a dark cave for a year alone. Mm -hmm. I didn't do it that long. My cave retreat wasn't anywhere near that long. But the idea, you go into the dark for a year, you know, that your circadian rhythms are going to flip because you're in the dark for a year. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's why so many retreats are dark retreats. They're like the Illusion Mysteries, I think a lot of them have some dark retreat time in them, right? Mm-hmm. So that circadian rhythm flips because what happens then? Life becomes literally, not metaphorically, literally a waking dream because mm-hmm. your chemicals are changing your brain. Wow. Yeah. So. It, very interesting. Saturn clocks. We're still talking clocks, aren't we? Without mm-hmm. me saying, I'm going to say the Saturn clocks. Mm-hmm. So we actually get to change the clock and reset it. That's making friends with Saturn. We got to make friends with Saturn. So there's been so much negativity about Saturn. It's really important to start making friends with Saturn, you know. Mm-hmm. And maybe maybe Mott, his consort, you know. And maybe Mott is uh, also called Themis in the Greek tradition. I think Themis. But it's got to do with keeping the seasons and the plant planets in order so they don't fall down. Isn't that mm-hmm. wonderful? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, we want that. We don't want them falling down. Mm-hmm. Even the wanderers who move need to be kept in order. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they go a little awry, right? We talk about a planet being out of declination. What happens then? Like Mars out of declination. We all know about that, right? <laughs> Yeah, like the way that planets can behave in ways not expected, but it's sort of like Saturn and Mott's job to make sure that there's still some larger pattern at play. And I think that's one of the amazing things with astrology, actually, is that no matter what you're going through, no matter how challenging it is, even if you think it's going to last forever, it really won't. Like everything has a season and a reason and a purpose to it. Um, Everything is about having that understanding that all things in time, right? Whatever comes for a time or goes after a time, it truly is okay. And I think that's part of making good use of um, astrology and the aspects and, and it's part of what motivates further astrological insight as well. But then the dreams connect to it in some way. So can you talk about that? How is it that Saturn that we think of associated with times, but dreaming, normally we think of dreaming as sort of outside of time. And so how do those connect there? Beautiful. So I I like to compare Saturn to uh, 
I live, as you know, in a very, very rural place. So we've got one of those tiny little airports. You, you've probably been, you know, like where there are cows grazing it. <laughs> really mm -hmm. tiny airports, becoming a lot busier now. So, so let's say, let's say, uh, let's say you go someplace, you know, and you come home and you live in a place like this with a tiny little airport and you come home really late at night and you're just dog tired. You know what I mean? And you just want to get home and get in your bed, right? So you, right, and you go to get your car, and then you drive the car up to the little gate, the, the, the flimsy little gate that lets you out to go home to your own bed, and you discover you don't have your ticket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. um, what do you do then? There's probably nobody working at the booth. It's a little tiny airport, right? And you, you know, you're, you're so desperate. You may be thinking, you may be hungry too. You may be thinking, I'm just gonna ram right through that gate. It's flimsy, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then, and then you kind of, you just kind of say a little prayer, and you kind of look at it and go, Oh my God, there it is. It was there all the time, and the, your ticket's there, right? Mm -hmm. But it's like that gate. We've got to eat our vegetables before we have our dessert, as Mum would say for, to the to a child. Right? You mm -hmm. gotta eat your vegetables first. Then you get the, you know, right? So we've got to do our Saturn first before we get to the Neptune and the, you know, and the asteroids and the, and, you know, because, you know, well, we don't want to be doing um, drugs that'll put us out of touch with the basic things we need to kind of really be grounded enough to make our life happen. Mm hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. 40 years ago, I, I, so I, I saw there was no place for drugs in my life because I needed to do my set. I needed to do the basic stuff to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to have dessert to go up into the universe. So mm -hmm. I, I think of Saturn as a gate, the gatekeeper mm -hmm. in, in a good way. I have a very good attitude for the most part towards Saturn. I think a lot came in, you know, when I do Becoming Saturn, I'll, I'll talk about this a lot more, but I think a lot happened uh, in the Middle Ages to do with the church and, you know, calling Saturn the devil and Seder and, you know, a lot of this happened later. If we go into history, I think we'll see a lot of that came later. Mm. The early, early, early Saturn going back to, you know, Babylon was really, you know, the scythe and... Um, and about connecting with the earth. As a matter of fact, there's an indigenous group of elders that gets together every seven years. And they, they put out very interesting definitions of things. One of them uh, is um, culture, the word culture. Mm. The word culture is often really defined more like the word civilization. The word culture shouldn't have anything to do with cities. Civilization has to do with cities. The word culture they defined as, and I like their definition, the original agreement that was made about how to live in harmony with the land. Mm -hmm. And I think Saturn goes back that far. Because Saturn's grandma is the primordial goddess. I won't go into detail on that now, but mm -hmm. Saturn goes way back. Mm -hmm. That scythe, that can, helping us stay in connection with the land. If we're going to do our agriculture, how can we do it? Where where we're in connection with the land and animals in harmony. And so Saturn is about making sure you've taken care of what you need to, like in the earthly realm, before you can really take a deep dive into the dreams that Neptune represents. Yeah. But we've got Uranus there in the middle. I'm just thinking creatively here, like any astrologer would. And Uranus is like that really shocking, surprising alarm clock that kind of comes out of nowhere, right? That sort of jolts you awake. And, and then for dreams to come after that in the sky, right? Because Neptune is further out, was discovered after Uranus. For dreams to come after that is a very powerful um, symbolism to consider that it's almost like... You have to be here now on the earthly plane in order to wake up, in order to then really make the most of whatever your dreams might be. Beautifully put. Yes, I basically, if it's a dinner, I think that, that Saturn is the veggies and Uranus is the baked Alaska. You know, you get that flame all of a sudden, <laughs> it goes on fire. You go, what's that? Yeah. It's dessert. Oh my God, how exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kind of fun, huh? 
Yeah, it is fun to consider. Um, I, but I know that your talk, so once again, everybody, um, Catherine is going to be speaking about the medicine in your dreams, connecting it astrologically and mythologically and all that. But what, then how can we connect this understanding that you're sharing to medicine? How does that work, do you think? Yes, right. Well, first of all, I really, um, when I was going through my um, Saturn, my second Saturn return, uh, not my second, my second Saturn opposition in my, my early 40s. And of course, that's the Uranus opposition as well. That was very interesting because that's when I really realized this about dreams, that some dreams are when, in what I call a healing dream series, where they're connected to one another. Let's say you had a beautiful beaded necklace, uh, different kinds of beads, but they all looked great together. And they were on the same strand or the same thread. So these dreams are on the same thread because there's a theme. Mm. And yet there's, they appear to be separate. It's kind of like, did you ever play Connect the Dots when you were a kid? Of course, we all did, right? Yeah. 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 So it's like a Connect. I, I love that. It's like a Connect the Dots mm. puzzle. And you're connecting one dream to another because a certain theme is coming up. Mm. Now, for instance, I noticed that one of those themes personally for me that came in when I was in my early 40s was or orca whales, orca whales. Mm. Now, I knew quite a bit. I thought I knew quite a few whales because I, I was raised on Cape Cod on the, on the ocean on the East Coast. But mm. really, orca whales weren't a thing there, the black and white whales. So mm. when I saw these black and white whales in my dream, I really didn't know what they were, except that I knew it was very important. Why? Because I had many dreams with the black and white whales, and they were going this way, and I was swimming with them going this way north. And mm. I was on the West Coast at the time, so we were, we were all together going north. I was part of the pod. Mm. And then a map was presented without the name of the place. So a lot of very specific things were presented. I was clearly supposed to go somewhere. And I didn't know where, and I didn't know about orca whales. So at the same time, in my waking life, I had a, um, I had uh, something happened with a tooth, and I had to go to the dentist. And my dentist, I didn't know, he happened to be a marine biologist, right? So I put my head back, and he put the equipment in the mouth, and I'm looking at a mobile of whales coming from the ceiling. And, and one of them is a black and white whale. And you think that I put my body into an electric socket. I mean, I, you know how when you turn electric, but something really important happens, right? And so I, I had all the stuff in my mouth, but I just pointed at it. And he said, oh, that's an orca whale. And he started chattering about orca whales. And he said, and then out of nowhere, he said, oh, as a matter of fact, there's a place called Orcas Island. My whole body felt like, oh, my God, you know, where, where is that? You know. And he said, it's in uh, the San Juans. And I said, oh, Puerto Rico, because I was an East Coast girl. And he said, no, it's off the coast of Washington State. And so I was dreaming a lot of specifics about different people, things that happened about this place, and I didn't know where it was. And always the orca whales, repeatedly, month after month after month, bringing me there. And so I went to the place after that in my waking life. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, I met a lot of people who I met in my dreams. I ended up living there for a year and a half. On my, I took a sabbatical, right? And so, so that that period of time where Saturn was really activated again in my early forties, mm. right, was uh, right. Right now, I'm in a sap. I'm I'm in my third opposition. I'm in, in my mid seventies, very rich, and also mm. I had some go around with the tooth again that I ah. just got because it was going over my ascendant. Mm -hmm. Same thing. And so uh, I, I realized, so I had, the, I had the opportunity to go over a lot of dreams that I collected from clinical work with dreams for, for many, many years and see patterns that other people were having these, they'd have a symbol come up that would be repeated. And I began to do more and more research with, with the dreams I collected and the people that I was seeing and I realized that these dreams were connected with, with Saturn, with a time clock. And so the opening square of Saturn brings important dreams, like we talked about with Bruce, and then and then the first opposition. 
another important Saturn time is the first opposition of what Saturn. So Saturn is hooked into our growth and development. Seven years, 14 years, very key. If you could think back to your own life, anybody, you or anybody listening to this, what happened at six or seven? Did you have any realization about yourself? You know, did you have anybody come in? Did you have anybody that maybe was a ray of hope to help when mm-hmm. you, if you had a difficult situation? Mm-hmm. Or maybe an interest came and helped. Maybe you discovered reading or nature. Or maybe uh, Saturn represents older people. Maybe an older neighbor took an interest or a relative. Mm-hmm. I had a maid that took an interest in my life, if I think back. And she was just mm-hmm. wonderful, you know. Mm-hmm. At 14, that's when astrology came and bit me. Uh, that's the Saturn opposition, the first one. Yeah. That's the so think about your own lives. It's, did anything kind of cool happen, even if it was a tough time in other ways? Because, you know, our brains are wired to see the trauma first. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, and so it's, and it's important to see the trauma. And then it's important to look past it enough to see some of the good things that are being presented that help us be resilient to get through the trauma mm-hmm. and develop that hallmark of resiliency that is Saturn, too, that helps us. Then, then savor life. Mm. Incredible, incredible to consider the balance between dreams and integrating the dreams, but honoring our real life and how it is that we can bring the best of both together to enrich the meaning of both uh, is an incredible way to understand it. And that journey and that outcome is healing. That's why it's medicine because it ends up being powerfully healing to us as part of our spiritual journey, our spiritual growth, and just a life of more meaning and richness and purpose, right? We're able to understand, um, I mean, I want to say magic, but maybe that's not the right word. We want to understand the purpose to what might be playing out. And it is dreams that can really help us to do that. But It is only by also honoring the physical reality of the physical plane that we make the best of both. Yes, and and I feel it's very magic. And and I love Caroline Mm. Case's definition of magic. Magic is cooperating with all that is. Mm. Mm. I love that, don't you? Mm -hmm. So the, um, the magic of our little meeting here together is that the planetary hour where you're located for our meeting was Saturn's Mm. hour. No, yes, yes. It was the sun's hour. Mm. So Saturn Mm. was looking after after this project again. Saturn, this is Saturn's baby. Saturn is very happy with this, right? So uh, there is a lot of magic to it. And one of the things that I advise for people to to harvest that magic Mm. is to start something that I call an astro dream journal. Mm -hmm. Some people might be journaling their dreams. This is a little different. This is journaling um, what hour, you know, there's free apps where you can look at your phone and see, oh, what what planetary hour is this? Yeah, and I just wanted to mention that for those who may not know who are newer to astrological study, it's actually quite an ancient technique, um, but different hours. And it's not exactly on the clock. It's not like 6 p.m. It's this hour, 7 p.m. It's that there is a, an understanding of the cycles of a given day and that a particular hour of a given day will have the rulership of a particular traditional planet. So because it's a traditional technique, it is not going to include Uranus, Neptune, or Pluto, although I know some modern astrologers have incorporated that into our understanding of things like planetary hours. But I mean, you look at the work of like, for example, Plotinus, who was this, you know, ancient magician, we can call him, right? A spiritual practitioner um, and connected to Plato and very inspired by that and a, a student of that time. That's how long ago we're going. And I remember that it was um, Plotinus who said that if you're going to do a ritual, you want to consider the nature of the ritual. And then you want to find 
the planetary hour in which you're going to do that ritual and who the angel is associated with that planetary hour that you are going to petition and you want to get all your correspondences we can say together so for example uh, if it's the hour of the sun then you might want to have like an orange candle or a yellow candle and, and or a citrine stone right so that's just being really simple to understand magical practice um, and some of the the reasoning behind Behind that. And I do explore some of this for those of you out there in one of my books called uh, Prayers to the Sky, which is like astrological magic light. Now, all of that is to say it was Plotinus who said, you can, uh, you can gather all your tools, you can be in the right planetary hour, you can petition the right angel. But until you actually speak it, it has not manifested. But once you speak it, it has already manifested. And so it's so interesting to consider because now we live in such a different world. We're Zooming with people in different time zones like we are right now. So we're taking planetary hour into consideration, but we're doing it so that we can have a conversation. And we are doing it for the purpose of an understanding of taking a dream and making it real and what is that really and speaking these things into uh, an existence that makes it real for the people who are watching this interview. Yes, and you and I got to have to do a presentation together on dreams and astrological magic. Oh, I would love that. That'll be so much fun. We will plan to do that together. Uh, Once again, everybody, uh, you can see Catherine is so amazing. Catherine O'Connell, we're going to do a ritual together somewhere in the world, right? She's going to know the astrology of it. I'm going to talk about the magic of it, and it's all going to come together. We have spoken that into existence. Uh, But you can see why I instantly felt connected to Catherine and how brilliant she is and insightful and compassionate uh, and loving, really. That is really key here. It's about the love that you bring. Love makes everything bigger. Love makes everything more powerful. And that includes a love for astrology, a love for your dreams, a love for psychology and all of that. And so uh, all of that love radiated from you uh, here today, Catherine. And to remind everybody out there, Catherine is part of the March 2024 speaker series at Synchronicity University. So you've got just a little time left to choose your tuition rate as low as just $5 a class to learn from Catherine and other brilliant minds as well. Catherine, thank you again for being here. I loved getting to know you. Thank you so much. We met our intention, which is love. Yes, at the perfect moment, in the perfect time, it came together, which is a a beautiful thing as well. So thank you. And thank you again, everybody out there for watching. Until we connect again, take care. Bye.